My name is Allison Harding, and I'm the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Asian Art Museum. Thank you all for joining me in Samsung Hall today to hear a talk on Indonesian contemporary art by Tony Godfrey. Before we begin, I would like to thank my colleagues Anna Hortiosa, Sally Lee, and Nancy Jacobs for helping me with the planning of today's program. I would also like to thank Coral Reef for videotaping today. Tony Godfrey comes to us from Singapore. He currently serves as director of research at Sotheby's Institute, where he has worked since 1989, co-founding Sotheby's Masters in Contemporary Art in both London and Singapore. He's also taught at Plymouth University, Yale, NYU, Oxford, as well as a number of art schools. Tony has been publishing on contemporary art since 1978, and is a regular contributor to leading contemporary art periodicals, including Art in America, Art Monthly, Leap, and Burlington Magazine. Some of my personal favorites in Tony's long list of book projects are The New Image, Paintings in the eight, Painting in the 80s from 1986, Drawing Today from 1990, Conceptual Art from 1998, and of course his most recent tome, <laughs> Painting Today, published by Fiden in 2009. We are delighted to have Tony here this weekend for two contemporary art programs. In addition to today's talk on contemporary Indonesian art, Tony will be here tomorrow at 2 p.m. for a conversation with painter Jung Chong Bin on contemporary ink painting. This conversation is not to be missed, and I hope that many of you will join us as well tomorrow. So please join me in welcoming Tony Godfrey. I, I should just start by thanking the, um, the museum here for bringing me over to uh, San Francisco. Um, I, I also have to thank my employers, some of his institute, for letting me escape from the tropics to this beautiful cold and wet weather for a week. Um, I, I'd also like to thank um, my friends Tony and Kevin for putting me up while I'm here, and my friend um, John Rhodes for helping with my travel um, to here. Um, I've got quite a lot of images, so I'm going to move quite quickly once I get going, and then I'm very happy to answer quest any questions you've got. Um, I'm very aware that Indonesia is a very large country, almost as big as this, so to give an introduction to its contemporary art in, in one hour is, to say the least, difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm going to keep moving. Um, I've got names of all the artists put on the, the slides, and all I can hope to do is give you some of the flavor of a very, very lively, but perhaps surprisingly complicated art scene, and one that's very, very little known outside. Um, we'll explain these images a little later when we, we get there. And I, I was very aware that there was an exhibition about Bali, so I, I just started off by adding a few images about Balinese art, and which in itself is extremely curious. Um, the central, one of the key for you things you need to know about Indonesia is that there are basically four art schools. There's one in Denpasar, and if you go to the art school in Denpasar in Bali, you either study traditional art or you do modern art. It's a total divide. The, tradition, the, the traditional art has really grown up and for many people has been a fascinating phenomenon in the way it's adapted in the 30s and 40s to um, the contemporary life of the time. So you see this traditional, um, you can see the styles very similar to what you see in the exhibition downstairs but it becomes, does become very decorative in recent years. I find this very difficult now to, to um, appreciate because the, these images are mass-produced in Bali. Have, have any of you been to Bali? Yeah. Have any of you been to Indonesia apart from Bali? Not many, but a few. So the, there is this tradition um, the the, the fa most fascinating figure, and I'm, I'm glad to say there's a wonderful drawing by him 
in the museum on the, the top floor um, is Igosti Neumann Lempad, who supposedly lived to 112 and carried on drawing right to the end. Um, this is him with his daughter doing a, a temple painting. Um, I, I, when you do go to Bali, do, if you, you go, do go to Ubud, because there are no less than four art museums there, and they have generally very, very good collections. But um, if you think this is a bad slide, it's not. They don't have air conditioning, and the works are slowly falling apart. So go sooner rather than later while they still exist. But, but Lempad has this extraordinary drawing style. One of the things I very much want to talk about today is the strange position many Indonesian artists find themselves in and how they relate to the traditional culture of Indonesia and how they relate to modernism. And even the history of 20th century Balinese art is very strongly affected by Western people. The artists are brought together by um, Werner Spies, a German artist, um, Rudolf Bonnet, and they adapt. They have a very wonderful relationship between them, but it's, it's quite problematic to understand. And of course, this is probably the, the artist most wanted in Southeast Asian circles, um, um, Le Maire, who's Belgian and whose entire later career develops really around this type of painting, which is, I suppose, impressionist painting 80 years late, invariably featuring his um, very beautiful wife, Ni Pollock, who was a Balinese dancer, who was mm, a few years younger than him, shall we say, about 40, I think, and it's very much a, a dream, and they're, they're highly decorative, highly beautiful um, Pacific escape paintings. And if you go to Bali, his house is maintained, and you can see it's a mixture of Western oil paintings of um, mainly women without many clothes on, and Balinese carving. It's, it's, it's really rather nice. And then you can just go off, literally look over the wall, and you can see Balinese ceremonies on the, the beach opposite. And Bali itself is, is still maintains its position as a refuge for artists from, I was going to say the West, but it's not. It's a refuge from artists from America, Europe, and, and to some extent, a growing extent, China and Java as well. Um, there's a real sense in which Bali is being colonized by um, Javanese. Um, this is a, a painting by Ashley Bickerton, a very well-known American artist, well-known in the um, 80s, who's been living in Bali now for, I think, 16 or 17 years. And perhaps in, an indicator of how art in Indonesia is developing. It's only been in the last two years that he's started to become very involved in the, the actual art scene of Indonesia itself. I'm assuming you know nothing about Indonesia or Indonesian history. Correct, okay. <laughs> um, art has, painting especially, has a particular resonance in Indonesia, because at the time of the independence struggle with Holland, 1940, in the 1940s, many of the artists were active fighters in the um, war. Also, the first president, Sukarno, was a passionate supporter of painting and a painter himself. Um, one of the things that ambassadors did to curry favor was to give him paintings. Uh, painting by Hendra Gunawan, The War Wedding. And you can see that the, the painting style is quite rough and ready. It's about um, a soldier getting married in the village before going off to fight the, the, the Dutch. And 
there are three or four major painters, Hendra Gunawan, Afandi, Zajajono, and they form a basis for a really, a, a growth of art. They're, they're something that arts, art students or younger artists could fall back on. And they also form the basis for a very, very strong collecting base. This is the um, house of Dr. Wee. Um, one of the interesting factors in Indonesia is the vast majority of the collectors are ethnic Chinese. Um, the artists themselves are either Javanese, sometimes Sundanese, which means West Javanese, um, and, and as we'll see, a healthy sprinkling of Balinese artists who, for reasons I will explain, don't normally work in Bali, and artists from um, Sumatra. Um, and you can see this is a, this, uh, a Hendra painting over here on the right, and uh, paintings by Afandi here. You can see, if you look at the detail here, that the Hendra obviously had a seriously good look at Gauguin. Um, and Afandi obviously has a very seriously good look at um, Van Gogh. At the same time, because of their position in the 40s and 50s as a non-aligned country with strong links to um, the Soviet Union, Cuba, etc., there's a healthy dose of socialist realism that creeps into um, Indonesian art. But um, the two crucial, or the independence is the first crucial event. A second crucial event is 1965, when the Sukarno government is overthrown. Um, and I have to choose my words very, very carefully here. Uh, the Sukarno had, was basically at war with the British Commonwealth and his government was economically unsound, but had also been destabilized um, by British Secret Service, who'd spread a tremendous amount of rumors. Um, there was what may or may not have been a communist coup that went wrong, um, which bizarrely failed to kill um, Suharto. Suharto, it's now confirmed, was actually on a retainer from the CIA. Suharto came to power and set up a government that was much more friendly towards the United States. Between estimates range between 60,000 and 2 million people were killed in a horrific bloodletting over six months, which was especially bad in Bali. Um, people who were thought to be communists or people who weren't liked which very often meant ethnic Chinese um, were killed. Anyone with left-wing leanings was either killed or put into prison. Um, this is a painting by Hendra Gunawan when he was in prison. Um, and you can see he's feeding a dead lizard to his cat. Um, there was not much food for prisoners. And in fact, I mean, the very sadness of the story is the prisoners ate the cat soon after this painting was made. And when you travel around Java, which is 70% of people in Indonesia live in Java. The other three main art schools are all in, in Java. You'll see many monuments to this. And the, the war monuments in Indonesia are really quite aggressive. They're monuments to national liberation rather than monuments to the dead. Under Suharto, there's a tremendous amount of censorship, and a lot of artists react by making abstraction, making art that doesn't mean anything. The, if any of you want to understand Indonesia, the, the best book to read is one of the great novels, and the least known novels of all time. It's the Buro Quartet by um, Premuhendra Anatur. Um, it's in a very good English translation. It's sort of Dickensian. So artists like Ahmed Sadali move from a sort of polite, cubistic form of art to um, abstraction in this period, running from, I guess, from the 60s through to the 80s. 
And here you get a central, sort of pivotal split. The other three art schools, Jakarta, Bandung, and Jogjakarta. The art school in Jakarta itself is much stronger now for audio, um, new media. The art school in Bandung was set up with Dutch teachers, and it teach, teaches de style Bauhaus type art. Um, this is the Bandung Art School. You can see some of the students are doing color theory. Um, Inner Supriento is actually a, a, a very good um, Indonesian writer um, who spent three years in prison under Suharto for um, political complaints. So Bandung is this sort of center for modernism, but Jogjakarta, um, normally spelled J-O-G-J-A, Jogja, is much more expressionistic, much looser. And most of what I'm going to talk about is to do with Jogja. And here you get one of these curiosities that I know of no other country. All the artists live in one town, Jogja. All the collectors live in another town, um, Jakarta. And Jogjakarta is, you know, a medium-sized Asian town of about two to three million people in. None of the buildings are more than six stories high which is probably sensible, seeing that you get earthquakes and volcanoes near there, but is mainly, I gather, because the Sultan has decreed no building should be higher than that, because he doesn't want his view of the magic mountain, Merapi, spoiled. The image I partly put here because it's the printmaking studio, and one of the many curiosities about Indonesian art is you have a lot of students trained as printmakers, but there is no market for prints. So you get curiosities such as, um, actually common curiosities, Andre Tanama, who is a printmaker, but put, makes prints, woodcuts, giant woodcuts, on to um, canvas. Basically, it's a painting. So there are strange things that happen. Also, paper is problematic in the tropics, for obvious reasons. And another thing that perhaps might be surprising is, as, as you obviously know, Indonesia is, in theory at least, a predominantly Muslim country, that 86% of the population are supposedly Muslim. But m several of the artists are, in fact, um, Chinese. Sorry, Ch not Chinese, um, Christian. Um, this is actually a whole series of paintings or prints by Andre Tanama where about a, a girl called Gwen Silent who is a stand-in for Jesus. I, I put in a lot of photographs of the artists themselves because I just want to give you a flavor of the people and the scene. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say I'd much rather that Andre had some clothes off because he's spent three years having tattoos put on his body is entirely covered with tattoos of his own design. Um, most of the artists have tattoos, sometimes extensive. That's a, a very curious phenomenon. And you, I don't know if you can really tell on this photograph, but there is a tropical rainstorm going on um, behind him. We're actually in the, um, the, the Langan Art, Art Foundation in, in Jogjakarta. Another important element within the art world is under the Suharto years, before 68, artists finding ways to complain. Um, so this is seen as the most controversial artwork in the 20th century in Indonesia, where an artist called Jim Sapungat presented an image that was part um, a Majapat queen and part a girl in Western clothes half stripping off. And this was seen as absolutely scandalous in corrupting and has become a banned object. And artists through the 80s and 90s would either kowtow to what was essentially a, a semi-fascist regime or try and make coded protests. So artists such as Harry Dono, 
probably the best known artist in Indonesia until recently, made objects like this, worked with Wayang, uh, shadow puppets, much like the ones you see downstairs, but also made paintings here, searching for the true president. And again, very coded, very difficult to know what it is, but it's indirectly an attack on the whole Suharto um, regime. The Suharto regime collapses in 98. Um, it's a photograph two years before, in 96, at the funeral of his wife. There's always been a strong rumor that his wife was shot by mistake when two of her sons were having a fight over money. Um, Suharto, it's now assumed, absconded with more money than Marcos in the Philippines. So this is probably the, um, on either side of Suharto, the um, two daughters, and behind him, the four sons. Um, we're talking, we're looking at people who became billionaires through um, corrupt practices. 98, following the um, economic crisis, the Suharto regime collapses and democracy returns to um, Indonesia. But what it does within the art world is unleash a tremendous amount of street art and a lot of very active political art. This is an apatomic comic, um, comic chemist is what it really means. And if you go around Yogyakarta at any time, there's a phenomenal amount of street art, graffiti, wall art, often of a really high standard. Um, and it's, people respect it to an incredible degree. It's seen as an indigenous art form. Ninety-eight is also highly problematic. It's not just this wonderful revolution where a fascistic regime is overturned. Nobody quite knows what happened. In the same way as no one really know, knows quite what happened in 65 and 66. No one knew really whether it was a communist coup. Nobody knows quite why, at this moment of revolution in 98, there is mass looting in Jakarta, which is um, especially targeted on Chinese um, ethnic shopkeepers. And for many people, for the um, ethnic Chinese intellectuals, this is something that uh, if you like, has left a very, very sour taste. Um, the ethnic Chinese in Indonesia had, under Suharto, controlled a very large proportion of the major industries and um, firms. So both these paintings on the left by Sojo Jono, on the right by Agus Suwagi, are very much about presenting heroic young figures, but yet knowing that these revolutions um, were profoundly ambivalent. Uh, a piece here by Agus Suwagi. Agus Suwagi, um, I mean, ethnicity, to some extent matters in Indonesia. I think uh, Agus is half Chinese, but is, uh, the, the Bahasa word is abangan, abangan, a token Muslim, that um, he wanted to marry Titarubi, who is Muslim, and therefore he had to become a Muslim himself. And I, I did ask him how often he goes to the mosque, and he wasn't sure whether it was once in his life or whether it really counted, because he was only there for a few minutes. But the operation was painful, he said. Um, and in this piece, he's really expressing the tension of this period when an entire regime collapses. It's an army tent, there's a loud radio program going on, and inside there are all these um, film posters, of really sort of cheesecake images, but with this menace added to it. Agus on the left. One of the things I do now that I live in Asia, I very often work in, in collaboration with other writers, um, local writers. Uh, so uh, I'm writing a, 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 a book with someone from Sumatra, um, 
possibly another book we're sometime in the future we have um, curated with the rather wonderful or shocking name of Leah uh, Swastika. Um, and this is um, a, a Chinese um, writer I work with, um, called Wang Kaimei, uh, doing a series of interviews with artists in Southeast uh, East Asia. And Agus himself on the left, and like all good Jogjakarta artists, he does have tattoos. I'm here of paradise and hell. And what well, just to go back, the t shirt probably starts to tell you something that these are people who have an interest in traditional Japanese culture, but are also fascinated by rock music. Again and again, you'll talk to people and they'll say how, how important Wayang is to them. And you'll say, well, um, Agus, when did you last go to a Wayang performance? And they'll think for a minute and they say, well, when I was a student, I went, or 10 years ago. So this is a moment in time when a lot of artists are leaving their traditional culture behind and trying to work out something different. The influence of Japanese anime and manga is enormous. Oh, Agus himself has a, his own rock band, which normally does cover versions of the Beatles song. And this is true of a lot of Indonesian artists. The work is very often quite over the top. So here you have a giant bowl of rice with a gold-plated skeleton in. I, I think rather a, a vulgar piece. But on, on the wall you've got something which is, I, I think one of the great artworks of our area in the last few years, where what he did was take, make 50 watercolor copies and he's a fantastic watercolor artist, of images of performance artists from around the world. Nan Goldin, um, Carlos Amarales from Mexico. Jeff Koons, Carol Lee Schneeman, and so on. And very much relating to the issue of making art when you're far away from the supposed center. But in this case, not just copying, but taking things over and changing them, making them into something new. Indonesia is always referred to as a syncretic culture, a culture that brings things from, in particular from India and China, and brings them together, muddles them together, and makes something new. Balinese culture is very different from Indian Hindu culture. And in his work, there's often a way of thinking about his own position, but also his own position, the position of his country in um, history. One of the things you have to be, be warned of if you're thinking of going to Indonesia and meeting the artists, they all smoke like chimneys. And also cigarettes in Indonesia have cloves in, so they are, smell very strong. Um, and here what you have are a series of paintings of famous people all smoking cigarettes with their left hand, from the Mona Lisa to James Joyce to Frida Kahlo um, to, most importantly of all, this person, Cheryl Anwar, who is the um, poet who was writing in the 40s or 50s in Indonesia, who died very, very young, who's this romantic figure. And the only thing that really unifies Indonesia is the language, this shared language, which is, um, there are 250 other languages, about 200 racial groups with Indonesia, but there is this one shared language. Again, in the house of Dr. Wee, you can see um, Marilyn Monroe smoking. So with Agus, you get this play with um, popular culture. You also, in Indonesian art, you do get 
high standard of technical skill. I, I recently had two very different conversations with, um, in one case, a curator, in one case, a dealer. And one of them said, if you need to want to understand Indonesian art, you must go and meet Nasiron. And the next day I met a dealer and said, well, you know, Nasiron represents everything that's wrong with Indonesian art. It's this sort of thing you, you find out and you have to work out for yourself. Uh, so I went and met Nasiron and had a wonderful time. Um, he laughs a lot. And so you've got, again, this ambivalence, a T-shirt with the name of an English rock band and a man who collects traditional Javanese culture. He's laughing because he's got a book that's been given, him to, given to him in readiness to meet me called Simple English for Artists, where you have useful phrases such as, let's eat, let's have lunch together. We have delicious food like pechel ayan, which is um, chicken, ayan is chicken. And painting by him, but you can see this collection of Javanese sculptures, objects, um, and his, uh, as a, the Indonesian art world has a lot of money. Um, so many of these, several of these artists are extremely wealthy, and he has used that wealth to build a phenomenally beautiful garden. Um, when I asked him, incidentally, how long it took to grow, he said, three years. The soil in Java is phenomenally fertile because it's volcanic and it rains a lot. And the laughter here is because he's just told me, well, I've, I've rebuilt a traditional um, mosque in my garden. And I've just asked, oh, do you do your prayers there? And he says, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, no, I'm a, I'm a Javanese Muslim, which means something for him, very different from um, a reformed or fundamentalist Muslim. And this is the inside of his traditional mosque. It's where he keeps his guitar and um, wayang. And he has a phenomenal collection of traditional art. Uh, you can see some dolls up there, sorry, puppets, wayang golek. And, and also, it's very typical of a certain type of Indonesian artist has spent a lot of his money buying work by artists he's known that have felt have been underrepresented. So he's built up his own collection, his own history, and is now building his own museum to show that collection in, which opens in October this year, uh, which has his only commitment is to, or contribution to that is to paint the skylights. You get a sense of what his painting is like. This is the only painter I know in Indonesia who uses oil paints, which is why I, the, the reproductions are very poor. This is his painting of the recent um, explosion in Mount Merapi. All the people fleeing from the um, volcano, but protected by some flying spirits. Uh, Javanese uh, culture, like rather like, it has a tremendous amount of mythology left in. The rest of the Muslim world regard uh, Java as about the most un-Muslim of Muslim countries. Puto uh, Sutiwajaya, and I think I've spelled the surname incorrectly. We always just refer to him as Puto. Uh, in even my Indonesian friends some find some of their names difficult. Uh, Things are made complicated because everyone has a nickname. Um, Puto is Balinese, and, but I asked him, why, don't, why do you live in Jogja rather than Bali? He says, well, the trouble is being Balinese, you have to spend so much time at all these ceremonies and they go on for so long. There's no time to do any art. Uh, and as you can see by this sort of pile of stretches behind, he likes painting and he does a lot of painting. And, sorry, let's go back on the right. He was a dancer. He was a Balinese dancer, and apparently very, very good. And I think that flows into his paintings, which very much come out of an interest in dance, 
and the, the body. They're painted very, very quickly. Um, very often you can see, like most exiles, in the sense he's an exile from his own island, uh, very interested in thinking about, about the meaning of Balinese customs. And for, I'm sure everyone in this room, what's that? For anyone in Indonesia, it's the chilling image, it's the hat you associate with um, Suharto. And this is the painting he made at the time of Suharto's death. It's this sort of image that hung over the whole um, country. And Putu, likewise, has been an enormous beneficiary of a I, I'm very bad at American English. I get very confused between bull and bear markets. When the market's going very well, is that a bull market? It's a bull, okay. It's been a bull market for Indonesian paintings for the last 10 years, and this is the second giant building he's built to show young artists. So this is, this is the third of these artists. Agus Sawagi has been a major supporter of other artists. Um, uh, Agus was quite a successful graphic designer beforehand, but as most artists used to stay at his studio, he supports other ventures, um, and uh, Aputu has, has built this museum for, to show younger artists, um, and, and employs a very good curator to run it. Um, one thing I've not done is put really good photographs of environments, but you can see all the rice fields out there. One, one of the extraordinary things about Jogjakarta is that it's a town that feels like a village. You're constantly going down a road and being surrounded by rice fields. So the, the division between town and country is, 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 is very curious. It's like the two muddled together. Uh, this is on the... Don't worry, this is not a bad Muslim drinking wine. This is um, a Balinese artist. They're allowed to drink wine. Uh, Masriadi. Uh, who is again Balinese, um, and perhaps a slightly unusual, most of the artists really have a very open studio, they float in and out, they, their timekeeping is terrible, but they're incredibly social. Um, Master Adi Robert has encased himself in his wife, looks after events, and he doesn't go out that much. And this is the, the first paint, this has market importance. And this is the first paint, uh, Southeast Asian painting to sell for more than a million US dollars. An early painting by my master Adi, just after Repamasi, after the fall of Suharto, and it does indicate, I suppose, the violence that's been inherent in Indonesian society. It's called The Man from Bantul. Bantul is a, a, a town quite near to Jogjakarta. And it's this horrific image of someone being beaten up by two other over-muscled boxers with this um, minuscule referee down here. It's a very curious vision of the world, and a very curious way of working in that um, these are both paintings about 10 years ago. The, the painting, at a, at a very late stage in the painting, he will get a magic marker and scribble all over it. So there's this curious overload. The paintings, especially from a few years ago, have very strong um, antagonisms towards... Uh, there are social issues in Indonesia. A, a vast proportion of the wealth is in the hands of very, very few people. Corruption is appalling. You can see on this detail here, just some of this scribbling detail. Um, 1999 painting. And here, um, another, the major collectors, Dedi Kusama, showing uh, a group of my students that very same painting um, in his, uh, I suppose, private museum in Jakarta. Uh, Handy Veerman Suputra is sculptor from Sumatra, Minang, uh, 
down. And curious in that this is the, the, the sculpture on the right by him. The bottom half is the cast of a table, literally the thing that's, that's suspended above it, and that's suspended by these two contents, which are called sarongs, which for him are a reference to um, traditional culture. Uh, one series of extraordinary pieces of works he did for a hotel where, having been basically put in a hotel and told to make work to go with it, so he started to make a whole series of sculptures based on things such as clothes pegs, towels, and here you can see that the, this towel, which is actually, um, I think, fiberglass, has these Chinese landscapes painted on it, which is it's a very, very beautiful and rather curious um, object. Uh, and Handy, Handy Veerman um, belongs to a group of artists um, known as the Jandela Group, all of whom come from Sumatra, all of whom are um, Minang or Padang. Sort of rather nice place you get to eat to in um, Java. Uh, S. Teddy D. Uh, perhaps the biggest influence is pop art, and artists such as S. Teddy. Um, you can see no. S. Teddy has a. I mean, it's no secret. S. Teddy has a serious drink problem. Um, but he's essentially one of these artists who began as a painter, but increasingly makes sculpture. This is about 50 foot high in the National Museum of Singapore. And really is called the Love Tank. An artist who has very strong graphic ideas. Well, here you can recognize these from the um, title screen, they're called Funatics, F-U-N-A-T-I-C-S. And I, I think Georgia Carter is appealing to a lot of these artists for a variety of reasons. There are 3,000 artists working there, which is probably not much by the standards of some towns, but, but for Asia, that's a lot. There are a lot of technicians, there's a lot of technical skill they can call on. Um, and also a lot of money is brought in. So, Eko Negrujo lives in one of the outlying kampongs, or villages. And, and basically, when he moved there, some of the villagers said, oh, what's he about? But then, as he became really rather successful, he started to employ them all to make tapestries, to make sculptures. He used his money here to um, build a, I don't know the Bahasa word for it, but basically it's where the night watchman sits to make sure nothing wrong is happening in the village, and which is used as a conversation, if you like, a conversation island. Uh, that's his studio on the left. You can see his studio is made with um, rattan. And this is an artist, you notice, the the sort of um, figure at the top, who is interested in popular culture, but who's interested in transforming it endlessly. So the graphic style that you might you think of as someone like Egusti Alampad is now transformed by a knowledge of cartoon books from Japan or the West. These are... Um, these are actually not people, these are actually um, fiberglass models. I'm never quite sure what it's all about. It's very science fiction, sometimes it's very um, political. But this is an artist who does, the one artist who really plays with the notion of Wayang Kulit. Um, here, projection pieces here, wait. But you see that these, these are a new type of shadow puppets. These are almost uh, mutants from outer space. Uh, and here he's explaining to me what he plans to do at the Edinburgh Festival this year, which is a gigantic Wayan Kulit um, performance with a rock band playing as well. So it's an, an attempt to update Wayang. And in, in Jogja, he has his own shop where he works with a lot of people making cartoons, making multiples, T-shirts, 
so on and so on. Jamalda Alfie. Probably slightly different, and this is one of the artists who really has worked quite hard to learn about Western art. When you go to studios, you find very few books. So the, the knowledge of Western or modern art is often quite, quite slight. There's a strong enough community within Jogjakarta to keep it going, and there's also the antipathy to art from Bandung, which keeps them energized. And I don't have very good images of his work, but uh, with, with Alfie, it's very much a, a personal notebook type of art. Recurrent images appear again, uh, the stone, the cactus, the lotus. I've periodically said to me, I'm, I'm really a Buddhist. And the next time you meet him, you'll know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really a, quite a good Muslim. I try and pray five times a day. And recently, I think this is very much an indication of the way things are going, is, is very determined to become a global artist to make work that uses English as a language. A series of Blackboard works where he's taken um, phrases from famous Western artists and manipulated them, played with them. So I'm going to have to have a glug of water. So here you've got someone who's very much trying to um, become a global artist using phrases, um, conceptual art, forms from conceptual art. Uh, here there's very clear reference to the German painter um, Martin Kippenberger. Whereas other artists such as a fellow um, Sumatran Unisa are uh, really quite uninterested in that. Uh, Unisa is actually the only artist in Jogra I know who is in any way a devout Muslim. You don't visit him on Friday. Uh, he won't paint nudes because it's disrespectful to his wife. But his work is very curious because it moves from abstraction to what looks like a very childlike um, vision of the world. Um, this is basically the pointy houses. This is typical of Menang um, longhouses or traditional architecture in, in Sumatra or actually in Malaysia as well. And I think this is actually one of these interesting cases of an artist whose work looks quite primitive, very simple, but is actually very, very sophisticated. That's um, underlain by an, a real attempt to understand what drawing is or the word he uses is Kuretan, and C-O-R-E-T-A-N, for any of you that want to learn some Bahasa words. Um, and always when you start to look at language, words don't quite meet in the same. So Kuretan also means scribble, it also means incising. So it's a way of exploring drawing which is subtly different. And images of ideal worlds which are painted in this very simple way, which are very much about a vision of the world which is of complexity and fullness. So here this image of the tree and all around it, literally thousands of, of animals. So it's, I, I guess it's a bit like, I can do an American reference here, a bit like Edward Hicks and all the paintings of the Peaceable Kingdom. Anyone know where Edward Hicks is? Oh, good. We share something culturally. I, I, as you can tell, this is some of um, Chinese, um, ethnic Chinese artist, Aito Christine. Chinese people in Indonesia, much like Chinese people in Thailand in the 19th century, had to change their name. 
So it's very often too difficult to understand. Um, I, I haven't put any work, but one, one a very interesting artist called F.X. Harsono, H-A-R-S-O-N-O. F, always known as F.X. to his friends. F.X. stands for Francis Javier. Also, people not actually change the name. Everyone had to have a religion. So many of the Christian, sort of Chinese community became Christians. Um, Chinese temples were basically eradicated in the early Suharto period. F.X. Harsone did a fantastic performance where basically he wrote his name, but he didn't know what his name was. He had to go and find his birth records to find what his Chinese name was. And then, of course, it, no one had ever told him how to write it in Chinese characters. I, Aito is, is, is probably slightly different. She's moved from Bandung to um, Jogja, but lives quite far from the city. She lives a very sort of... Um, internal life with um, her cats and, and doesn't come out that often. And her work is extremely strange. I, I think she's a rather wonderful artist. It's abstract, but you can, don't have to look very hard till you see that this is, you spot a face and a hand and a stick. And she actually trained as a, as a printmaker. She's a fantastic etcher. And there's a very curious sense of space gesture in her work. Uh, if there's an American equivalent, it's probably an artist called Amy Silman, who I think has a perhaps not dissimilar notion of um, shape. Shapes which are abstract, but which somehow connect to a sense of the um, body. That's um, a wall in Ito's or Christine's studio. You can see. It's a collection of objects, this writing on it. It's a very, very private artist, but who now increasingly works in installation. And that's probably something that we are at the point of, of seeing a shift within Indonesian art to becoming much more international and seeing a lot more artists who um, work in installation forms. So, Lata, one. The last artist I, I want to talk about, um, Tintin Wulia. Um, and when I met with her and I said, Tintin, why are you called Tintin? She said, well, my real name is Clementine. Well, actually, my real name isn't that because my real name is, I can't remember, it's, she's ethnic Chinese from Bali, but her family had totally changed um, their names and she, she'd never really known her Chinese name. And in Indonesia, everyone gets given a different name. So the, one of the people I work for, Emerud in Srinagar, is always referred to as Uchok, because he's a Batak. Um, so or, another artist, I was always called Toko. I have no idea why, but people develop different names. But uh, Tintin um, really created a, a piece here. This is at the last Jakarta Biennale to a very, very young audience, very lively audience. Um, what she's done is really create this installation with miniaturized passports. And it's very much to do with the fact that the notion of identity, what does a passport really represent? And for her point of view, I mean, well, what is she? Is she Chinese? Is she Balinese? Is she Indonesian? Is she Australian? She's lived in Australia for a long time. Is she English? She's got an English boyfriend. So there's this tremendous play in, in all her work around notions of I identity. Um, very, very playful, which is typical of, of quite a lot of art. Uh, that's some um, Tintin up there overseeing the um, installation of an, another passport work um, about two years ago in a, a gallery in Singapore that no longer exists. Which is end of slide slow, click to exit. So um, I don't know if I really have a, a conclusion because I think we're at a point in We're at a very, very interesting position, generally in art in Southeast Asia. I, mean, I, I do travel beyond Indonesia and Singapore, where it, 
it's obviously the case that people have started to look at this rather forgotten and rather neglected area of the world. And there are a lot of artists. There is a, within most of these countries, some form of art market. It's very strong in Indonesia. If you look at the suburbs of Christie's sales of Southeast Asian art, two thirds or more is Indonesian art bought by Indonesians. So it's, Indonesia has, has the strongest um, internal market. It's also the one which has like, perhaps the strongest internal history of modern and contemporary art. So perhaps all I can say is that there are some really interesting artists dealing with really interesting issues um, who are well worth learning more about. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. <laughs>